Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this month's monthly uh, Equity Market Insight webinar. Uh, as usual, uh, you know, today I've got uh, one of my colleagues joining me. Uh, so today we've got uh, Srivatsa, uh, who's the manager of our core equity fund, and he also so manages the UTI hybrid equity fund among his other schemes. Uh, so what we're going to do today is I will first uh, spend maybe the first 15, 20 minutes uh, talking about some broad macros and setting some kind of perspective for you. Uh, and after that, uh, Srivatsa will talk about both hybrid equity and core equity and how he manages those strategies. Uh, and after that, of course, we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, I will request my colleague uh, Niranjan uh, to uh, bring up the webinar on the screen. Uh, so hopefully these slides are now visible to you and uh, we'll, uh, you know, kick off with the presentation. Uh, so first off, uh, you know, a uh, lot of the conversations in recent times have been about inflation. Uh, so let's take a look at the U.S. inflation numbers. And what you can see on this slide is two lines. One is the uh, services line, which is the red line, and the other is the goods line. Now, remember that in the US, it's the services which make up 57% of their overall uh, inflation measure and goods accounts for only 21%. Now, as you can see, there's a massive spike in the green line, but actually the green line is now significantly trended lower. The dotted lines, of course, plot the expectation of where it is likely to go, but you can already see that the goods line is well below 4%. Uh, and as far as the services line is concerned, unfortunately, that's the bigger part of CPI and it is still trending higher. Now, there are two reasons why this line is still trending higher. Uh, and we look at one of the reasons on the next slide. Uh, and this is essentially the job situation in the US. Uh, and what this slide essentially shows you is the number of jobs available and the number of people available to take those jobs. Uh, so this is actually number of job openings by number of people looking for a job. This is known as the JOLTS data. Uh, and what this data shows you is that there are two jobs available for every person in the US who currently wants a job. So, you know, this is a very unusual situation where the number of jobs available is in excess of the number of people who want a job. And therefore, we've got this unusual ratio, which was as high as 2, 2x, uh, currently still running at 1.7x, uh, which still suggests that there are less people actually looking for a job than the number of jobs available. This without doubt is pushing up wage inflation. And this is one of the reasons which is pushing services inflation in the US very, very strongly along with, of course, what they call rental inflation. Uh, but this is an unusual statistic because normally in most places we expect that there are more people hunting for jobs than there are jobs available. But here it is actually running in the opposite uh, uh, ratio. Uh, so moving on from this, uh, this is the context in terms of US inflation. Now, <clears throat> a lot of the conversation in recent times has been about the US Federal Reserve. When will it reach a point where it believes it has done enough in terms of hiking rates? And therefore, when will it pause? When will it decide that there is no need to hike rates any further? And then the next stage is a pivot, which means how long before they actually decide that now they are comfortable in terms of actually starting to cut rates. Now, the important point is that a pause is not a pivot. What we have over here is some previous data of how many months did the Federal Reserve remain on pause before it actually decided to cut rates. During the GFC, it took 15 months between the last year rate hike and an actual drop in rates. Uh, in 2000, during the dot-com phenomenon, uh, it took eight months. Two other instances that are mentioned here, 1994 and 2019, it took seven months. 
So very simply, one way to interpret this data is that currently the market still expects that there is likelihood of one to two further rate hikes in the US. And it could be anywhere between seven to 15 months from the last rate hike before the Federal Reserve in the US actually starts to consider the probability of cutting rates, at least based on past history. Uh, so if we presume that the last rate hike from the Fed may happen in April, it could be the end of the year or more likely early 24. And some of the comments that we are hearing from Federal Reserve governors in recent days suggests that they would rather stay on pause and the pivot may actually be more of a calendar 24 event rather than something which happens in calendar 23, even though the market is actually predicting a cut in calendar 23 itself. So a pause is not a pivot. Uh, there will be a period of time where the Federal Reserve will hold rates rather than pivot to lower rates. Now, this is what this you know context is now how do equity markets and bond markets react uh, to the last rate hike right because you get the last rate hike then you get a pause and then you actually get a rate cut how do markets respond to that that is what we are going to see on the next slide so what this slide shows you on the left hand side is how do equity markets behave after the last rate hike and on the right hand side, we see how do bond markets behave after the last rate hike. Now, let's start with the right hand side. The right hand side, you can see two lines, a blue line and an orange line, but both essentially trend higher, which means once the Federal Reserve is done with the last rate hike, and we've looked at several data points over there, you can see the right hand side, 82, 84, 87, 95, 97, 2006, 2018, uh, and also 80, 81, 89, and 2000. And you can see in all these cases, the line moves higher, which means once the last rate hike is in, Bond markets actually give you a fairly good performance over the next 100 days to almost 250 days. In all cases, there is a very good return that the bond market offers. However, if you look at the left-hand side, which is the behavior of equity markets after the last rate hike, you will see that the two lines actually diverge. Now, let's consider what these two different lines are, the blue line and the uh, yellow-orange line. The blue line shows you the behavior of equity markets when the yield curve is not inverted. What do we mean by an inverted yield curve? An inverted yield curve means that short-term rates, typically the three-month rate, uh, is higher than the two-month rate, which in turn is higher than the 10-year rate. Right. So when the yield curve is inverted, which is the yellow-orange line, equity markets do not do well even after the last rate hike, even after the Federal Reserve goes into pause mode. However, if the yield curve is not inverted, uh, which means that the 10-year rate is higher than the two-year rate, which is higher than the three-month rate, then equity markets do quite well after the last rate hike. Now, today, when we look at the US bond market, the rate is actually inverted. The curve is inverted. Short term rates are higher than the longer term rates. And therefore, when you look at the left hand side, what it means is that for equity markets, based on past history, environment is still not favorable because the yield curve is inverted. Whereas on the right side, as far as bond markets are concerned, it does not matter whether the yield curve is inverted or not inverted. Essentially, it is a good period for bond markets once the last rate hike is in. So that is the larger point that we are making on the slide, that the yield curve matters for stocks, but not necessarily for bonds. So uh, the bond market, if you look at US Federal Reserve futures, is suggesting last rate hike somewhere during this quarter or maybe in April. That would still be a good period for bond market returns. But for equities with the yield curve currently inverted, it's still not looking very, very favorable. So let's move on from that. Uh, and look at India inflation data. So what you see in this slide on the left hand side is CPI and core CPI. And on the right hand side, you can see the behavior of wholesale price index, which is wholesale prices and also consumer prices. Now, on the right side, the key point I would make is look at that massive increase in WPI, which is the orange yellow line. It goes up to almost 15, 16 percent. But for the first time, the recent prints have dropped 
below CPI. And what we can broadly say is that WPI is far more volatile. It tends to lead the CPI in India. Now that we've got WPI coming down for the first time in almost one and a half years, it's gone below the uh, 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 CPI. We can hope for the CPI to trend lower. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see what the RBI forecast is for inflation, they expect it to drop closer to 5% in the first quarter of 24, and then go up slightly again to about 5.4% in the second quarter of financial 24. But essentially, there is some indication in India both based on what the RBI is expecting, as well as what WPI is telling us, which is that inflation in India is certainly starting to cool off. And without doubt, India's situation is very different from the US, where we certainly don't have a situation where there are two jobs available for every person who wants a job. And therefore, we don't really have a very strong service component or a wage component pushing inflation. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide. This really shows you that in India, real rates are expected to remain in positive territory. Uh, real rates in India uh, with the recent policy rate hike, remember the repo is now at 6.5%. Inflation is running at about 570, which means that based on repo rate, we are now in positive territory as far as real rates are concerned. And based on the RBI projection, the real rate is likely to go up slightly in the days ahead. So I think what this really shows you is that policy rates in India are now in positive territory compared to CPI. They are sufficiently restrictive in some senses, and therefore we can hope for you know, bond investors to earn a positive return. And that is attractive as we'll discuss in later slides. Now, moving on to the next slide, <clears throat> which essentially shows you equity market behavior. Uh, the first slide shows you what's happening in terms of near-term equity market behavior. Now, one of the points which is interesting here is look at the difference between markets which have done well over three months and markets which have done well over one year. Markets like India, where there has been a strong structural growth story, did not get as badly negatively impacted during calendar 22. Our one-year performance as of Jan 23 still looks good. But if you look at the last three months, whereas there has been some optimism that the Fed is nearing the end of its uh, you know, rate hike cycle, what we are seeing is that the cyclical markets, the beaten down markets, have actually done far better. And markets like India have actually not done much, whether it's a one month or three month performance, we've actually been slightly weaker, though arguably there are other reasons as well, but why our markets have been weak. But I would just look at and juxtapose our performance next to that of Indonesia, which is another market which did very well on a one-year basis. But if you look at the one-month and three-month performance, India and Indonesia are very close to each other, which once again suggests that as there has been some optimism that we are getting to the end of the rate hike cycle, cyclically oriented equity markets have done better than India and Indonesia, where actually structural growth prospects are far superior. Uh, moving on to the next few slides, which will essentially take you through earnings and valuations. Uh, on this slide, I won't spend too much time. Earnings expected to grow 8% in the year ended March 23. And as of now, earnings forecasts are 19% growth in the year ended March 24. How have earnings estimates been behaving in terms of more, uh, you know, based on the revisions? That's on the next slide. You can see a slight downdrift in the March 23 estimates gradually coming down over the last six months. But earnings estimates for FY24 have tended to stay fairly flat. So there is a decline of about 7-8% uh, in the earnings estimates for uh, uh, March 23, but not so much in the uh, March 24 numbers. Um, yeah, if we just move on to the next slide. Um, this has got on the left-hand side, the trailing P multiples and the forward P multiples for the Nifty 50. And what you can see over here 
is that uh, when you look at trailing PE multiples, we are above the long-term average, which is that yellow line, uh, but well within the uh, upper boundary, which is one standard deviation above. However, when you look at forward earnings, we are closer to the red line, and which is why we would say that when you look at earnings multiples, the Nifty is closer to the expensive zone than it is to the uh, fairly valued zone or certainly not close to the long-term average. We can also look at the, these metrics on the next slide on price to book. Uh, so on the next slide, you've got price to book. The, here, the picture is slightly different. Uh, we are above the long-term average, but at the same time, we are halfway between the long-term average and one standard deviation above, which is the red line. So we are halfway between long-term average and the expensive zone. So it's in the fair value zone, but above long-term average. Uh, this is the picture as far as Nifty is concerned. What does it look like for mid caps and small caps? You can see that on the next slide. This shows you the picture for mid caps, the mid cap picture on the left hand side, very similar to large caps, it's now somewhere halfway between long term average and the expensive zone, not so much comfort on the small caps where despite their underperformance, it's closer to the expensive zone than it is to the uh, long term average. So in terms of order of preference. I think the large caps giving you a lot more comfort, mid caps slightly behind, but again in the comfort zone, small caps is where we still see a little bit of discomfort as far as valuations are concerned. Um, you can see another representation of this on the next slide. I won't spend too much time. This is just a mid cap versus nifty performance. And again, you can see there is a little bit of that premium, uh, which is there, which is the nifty uh, instead of being at a premium to the mid cap is at a 20% discount to the mid caps, but again, not as extreme as we saw in the past. On the next slide, uh, we've got the valuations of the Nifty vis-a-vis -vis the bond market, because all the valuations we have seen so far is the Nifty vis-a-vis -vis its own history, be it price to earnings or price to book. Now we are seeing what does the Nifty look like compared to the 10-year bond yield. Now, how do we do this calculation? We take the Nifty P multiple and we divide 100 by the Nifty P multiple. And then we compare that to the 10 year GSEC yield and we see what is the difference between these two numbers. The difference is currently negative 1.9%. At the worst point that has been higher than 2%, Currently, we are uh, at 190 basis point. So some improvement, uh, but in this zone, Below the yellow line, fixed income is far more favorable. So really what we would say is when we do a comparison of Nifty versus uh, the bond market, this is a more tactical indicator. Right now it indicates that fixed income is more attractive than really the uh, Nifty yields itself. Uh, so that's that's about it from a valuation picture. Uh, we'll move to the final summary slide. Uh, what we've got on the summary slide is just a wrap up of some of the things I'm talking about. The US Fed funds rate still expected to go higher. It's expected to cross 5%. The upper boundary is now 475. So maybe one or two rate hikes left. There is some expectation of a recession. That, that is why the dollar has become quite weak. Commodity prices, as you're aware, have corrected significantly, which is a good thing from an India perspective in terms of goods price led uh, 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 inflation. But of course, it does raise concerns about global growth. In India, the MPC just this week hiked rates to 6.5%. And they have demonstrated some kind of monetary, monetary policy restraint because they are continuing to say that their policy stance is one of withdrawal of accommodation. Uh, the budget was presented last week. Again, I would say over there, the thing which stood out the most is the continued focus on fiscal discipline, bringing the deficit down by 50 basis points in 2024, and further reiterating that the target is to compress the deficit further to 4.5% by FY26. In this context, the only point I would make, remember on the earnings slide, we had an expectation or rather the consensus expectation is 19% earnings growth in FY24. Now, when you have got the Indian Central Bank uh, hiking rates this week, still talking about withdrawal of accommodation as being the policy stance, you still have the US Federal Reserve likely to hike one or two more times. Fiscal policy is also currently restraining growth then at this point of time, both 
domestic growth and global growth appear to be slightly weak. And all of these pose a challenge to earnings estimates because all of these pose a challenge to growth as well as to earnings estimates. And that is why I would say, you know, while that 19% earnings growth estimate is the Bloomberg consensus for 24, I do think there is some risk to that. Uh, equities are trading above the long-term valuations, averages on price to book, not as bad, but on price to earnings closer to the expensive side and relative to bonds, bonds appear more attractive, which is why I mentioned this last time as well. For wealth creation, investors will need to continue to adopt a, uh, uh, you know, they need to have equities in their portfolio, so they should continue with a staggered approach. But for many other investors, the opportunity today is to shift your mindset from Tina to Tara. What does this mean? This is on the next slide. Uh, Tina is essentially there is no alternative. Tara means there are reasonable alternatives. So what we are essentially saying is that of course you need equity in your portfolio for long term wealth creation. Valuations are challenging. So do consider a staggered approach, whether SIP or STP that would be more appropriate. But the two opportunities which are looking reasonably attractive today, one is hybrid. Why? Because today the bond part of the hybrid can give you reasonably attractive returns and combine it with a lower equity exposure. And also in some strategies, there is perhaps exposure to gold, which is starting to look increasingly attractive as we start to see the potential for some time during 2023 uh, uh, or early 24 rates to start going down again. Further on the fixed income side, uh, if you look at roll down strategies, short to medium duration strategies, today you have a possibility that even on portfolio strategies with duration of two to three years, you are able to get a real portfolio yield well in excess of the current RBI forecast of inflation, which is likely to persist over the next year. And remember, Remember, RBI continues to uh, reiterate its target to guide inflation down to 4% and certainly to keep it within the band of 4 plus or minus 2%. So in that context, even fixed income products at the shorter end of the curve start to look quite attractive. So that's really about the investor mindset shift from Tina to Tara. Do consider these alternatives, which is fixed income and hybrid in your portfolio today. But of course, from a long-term wealth creation point of view, you will need equity in your portfolio. So that's about it from my side in terms of setting the larger picture. But I'll hand over to my colleague Srivatsa now, and he's going to talk about the strategies that he manages, which is core equity and the hybrid equity fund. And he manages this with a relative value approach, and he's going to explain to you what the meaning of that approach is. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Vedri. Uh, so, uh, I mean, hello, everybody. Uh, so here, today, I'm going to talk about uh, my core strategy, which is, uh, as Vedri alluded to, is a relative value strategy. Uh, I manage uh, the core equity fund, which is a large and mid-cap fund as per the SEBI classification, as well as an equity part of the hybrid equity fund. Uh, the portfolio is essentially the same. The only minor difference being that the UTI core equity is required to have a at least 35% allocation to mid caps. So to that extent, the mid cap part of the portfolio is higher. Whereas in hybrid equity, we have around roughly around 70% in large cap, 20% in mid cap and balance in small cap. While the stocks are same, the weightages may be a little different from each other uh, to, to kind of align with their respective scheme uh, strategies. Uh, now, just coming to the core value strategy or the relative value strategy, which we believe. Uh, now, Historically, if you look at the definition of a value strategy, it is always centered around buying something cheap. Uh, while this was quite relevant, uh, maybe 20 years, 30 years back when there was a lot of information arbitrage, in today's context, I think a buying cheap is probably not you know, a very kind of a, a, a right strategy uh, because today there is absolutely no information arbitrage. So if something is trading cheap, then there are reasons for it to trade cheap. I mean, you can assume that hundreds of investors would have looked over it and given it a miss. Hence, what we believe is for longer term wealth creation, uh, we focus on what we call the relative value philosophy. So number one, what we look at is a valuation. So we typically look at a good quality company trending below historical averages in, in terms of valuation. And here we look at both ends. 
one relative to its own history over a longer time frame, five to seven years, either on price to book or price to earning or metric, which is more relevant to that sector as well as the as as the company, and also the premium at which it trades to the market or discount at which trades to the market. So we look at the company from both the kind of parameters. The second uh, 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 filter that we have is that we want to ensure that the ROC is greater than the cost of capital. However, in this strategy, it is possible that an entry point, I may not have an ROC which is greater than the cost of capital. What we seek to ensure is that probably in the coming time period, whether it's one year or two years, there is a kind of a roadmap which is there, which will ensure that the company's ROC is higher than the cost of capital. Here, we also take comfort from the past track record of the company where it should have delivered ROC is greater than the cost of capital, or maybe there is a change in the management or some other circumstances, which will ensure that, you know, there is a, the, the, the ROC is will be higher than the cost of capital. But I think this is a core central point of the strategy. We want to ensure or convince ourselves that we take companies where the ROC or the ROE as the case may be is, is kind of higher than the cost of capital. Just to give an example, I mean, I would probably not be buying a mid-level bank at 0 0.4, 0 0.5 price to book if I don't see the RO, ROE is moving to 12, 13%. I may still buy a bank at 0 0.8, 0 0.9 price to book if I really see a visibility of the ROE is moving to 14, 15% over the next couple of years. The third is obviously the sound business. So here we focus on companies that are fundamentally resilient. And also there is a huge focus on the governance, corporate governance from an overall fund house perspective. So in this strategy, what we seek to achieve is a disciplined valuation approach that attempts to benefit from the fluctuation in the valuation cycle. So we believe that any good company typically goes through its own cycle of valuation, either ups and downs. And we want to capture from the down valuations to ensure that adequate return is generated from a longer term point of view. Yeah, next one. Now, obviously, all of us know that in any kind of value strategies, there is a risk of a lot of stocks going wrong or us finding value traps. Uh, but we have a lot of filters in place to ensure that the value traps are limited. The first and foremost is we kind of don't invest in companies with either poor operating cash flows or weak ROC through an entire cycle. As I said in my previous slide, I'm okay with buying a company which has got a lower ROC at a starting point or even a lower cash flow, but I need a visibility on both in the in, in the in the near future, maybe from one to two years, that they will revert to the normal levels which we are seeking for. The second is weak governance. I think that is a filter for the fund house, as I said. So most of our investment universe, we kind of filter it for weak governance. And wherever we find the governance is weak or the governance is deteriorated, we even exclude it from our universe. The third is leverage. While we are okay with leverage, but clearly I think we avoid companies with very high leverage uh, or which may face uh, debt servicing challenges in the future. Because in a tough environment, companies with leverage do tend to suffer more and you know they are a source of kind of value traps uh fourthly i think we would while you know we are okay to look at a relative strategy but we also would want to avoid companies or mature businesses which are available at expensive valuation just to give an example of where i'm coming from you know i'm i may probably still okay in buying hdfc bank at say 2.2, 2.3, or even 2.5 price to book because it trades at a 25, 30% discount to its longer term average. But I still may not be very comfortable buying Asian paints at 55, 60 price to earning multiple, though it may still trade at a 10, 15% discount to its three year or five year average. Lastly, we also typically tend to avoid companies that would see either a decline in terminal value or nil terminal value could be an oil leak lubricant company or a print company where you know the markets or we are convinced that the, the longer term uh, growth of the company is at risk or maybe the company may be in the sunset mode and may not exist 10 years or 20 years down the line however cheap the valuations are next one 
Uh, in terms of investment strategy, the first one which I talked is relative valuation. So this is a preferred metric. This is the first starting point which we see as what are the valuation vis-a-vis -vis the longer term uh, history. And we focus much on quality as well. There has to meet a certain minimum quality threshold for us to invest in this uh, strategy. The second is we typically tend to look at uh, uh, cyclical companies for mean reversion where we believe. So we believe that cyclical companies offer a good source of value for the simple reason is that when the cycle is bad, you know, when the steel cycle is bad, market typically tends to look at a shorter term time frame, looking at the price levels and then tends to give a much lower multiple based on the asset values. Uh, and that's a point where you can get in at 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 and you know make reasonable money out uh, out of the sector or stock. So just to give an example, if one were to look at the steel sector, I mean, when the steel prices are five hundred, five fifty dollars, and fifty sixty percent of the global players are making losses, that may be an opportune time to get into the sector because you know that over a period of time, supply will shut down because it's not viable and the prices cannot remain at these levels. And this is a time where you may also get a very attractive valuation because generally in such cases, market tends to focus on shorter term uh, news flow or shorter term earnings, uh, which can give you a good arbitrage opportunity to enter from a slightly medium to a longer term uh, aspect. The other part here is also that we are obvious of the fact that if we are taking uh, companies or sectors for cyclical, we also ensure that you know we take appropriate exit action or exit review uh, whenever the cycle is reached at the top. So here we take two cautions whenever we are taking. One is that we typically tend to buy companies or sectors where the cycle is adverse, where either the, there is a mid cycle or, or the down cycle. And where, you know, typically the stocks would be trading cheap on a price to book multiple, but probably very expensive on a price to earning multiple. So we are very conscious of the valuations that we are paying and more importantly, the cycle that we are getting in. Lastly, I think, not everything is value here. We are open to growth opportunities, but our condition is it has to be at a reasonable valuation. Now, given the kind of uh, you know the, the 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 maturity the market has, the efficiency the market has, it's quite uh, unlikely that you would find a, a a hardcore value stock amongst the growth uh, oriented companies. But however, if there is opportunities in the mid caps, specifically in the small caps where because of probably lack of coverage or lack of knowledge, uh, you could get growth opportunities at reasonable valuations. That's what we are focusing on. So when it comes to small cap companies in the portfolio, we typically look for quality. We look for what we call the C1R1 names in the small cap uh, companies. And thanks to our in-house research, uh, since we also run a very successful small cap strategy, uh, we believe that we could find some very good opportunities uh, on the small cap part. But here, the clear focus is on growth. We typically tend to avoid cyclical companies. So almost 80-85% of the exposure here, uh, I would say, is uh, growth-oriented, which are available at very reasonable valuations. So in terms of sector weightages, uh, today uh, we we kind of uh, uh, you know so 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 one if one looks at a valuation on a price to earning, as I said, the ultimate test of a value fund is how much cheap it is trading vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark. As you can see, both on the price to earning as well as on the price to book, especially the price to book that may give you a better indicator. Uh, we are trading at almost 50% discount. And across sectors, if you see whether it is auto, capital goods, chemicals, uh, we are at a substantial discount to the uh, to the overall uh, you know market sector wise. And some sectors, like for example, if you look at a consumer durable, where the average price to earning multiple is 63 times, and price to book is at 11.8 times, we have consciously avoided that sector as well because the valuations of that particular sector is high. So this gives you a very good perspective that the fund is extremely disciplined towards this approach in terms of finding value-oriented, relative value-oriented stocks across sectors. So each sector, if you see, I think most of the sectors we have uh, our, our uh, uh, kind of uh, or, or the average valuation of our stocks is far lower than what is there in the benchmark. Next one. 
<clears throat> in terms of sectoral movements, so we have now a positive bias on auto and auto component, uh, uh, financial services, healthcare, and uh, and uh, IT. Uh, and while being negative on metals and mining, consumer durables and 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 services, uh, as well as FMCG. And uh, now coming to the overweight sectors, I think uh, for the last twelve to eighteen months, we believe that uh, there is good opportunities in the domestic oriented sectors such as auto components or or financial services more of a top down approach because we saw a kind of a domestic recovery happening and we also saw the worst of demand you know being over on account of covid and some kind of a revival happening uh, in the covid hit sectors uh, which explained the rationale for going overweight in auto in the last 12 months as well as in financial uh, services as well though we have reduced our weightages in financial services post the sharp outperformance in the last three to four months uh, as well as a big sector for us is reality as well where we have closer to two percent plus kind of an active weight again a combination of a strong domestic uh, demand and more importantly we also see a structural change in the sector which we wanted to capitalize and in terms of our negative weights, uh, active weights is largely consumer durables. As I said in the previous slide, the valuations are very expensive for our comfort. The same thing holds good for consumer services as well as FMCG. While we like the growth in all the three sectors, but clearly valuations are far, far above our comfort level. Uh, in terms of changes, I think if you look at, uh, the, we, have, we have kind of maintained a high active weight in healthcare. Uh, we believe that healthcare offers good opportunities. So this healthcare portfolio comprises both pharma as well as hospitals. So we have investments in both. We believe that the sector offers good opportunities because I think the sector, especially the pharma, has gone through the worst in the last couple of years. Uh, we believe that you know the the there is a silver lining and stars are looking up on the pharma part, and the valuations are also quite reasonable. Uh, the other sector where we have increased our exposure is information technology. Uh, this 0.57% is not fully reflective of our overweight stance because one IT uh, company gets classified as a consumer services. So if I add that, it's a clear 2% active weight that we have uh, on, the, on the portfolio uh, as far as IT is concerned. Again, there a year back, we were negative on the on the on on, on the sector and you know we were almost underweight by closer to five percent because we did not find the valuations appealing at all however there has been a significant correction in the valuation in the last six months and we saw value coming back in the sector three four months back and we started increasing our exposure so this is a high quality sector available at very reasonable valuations and the growth expectations in this sector today stands at anywhere between 8 to 12 13 percent which we believe is clearly achievable and also all the companies in the sector as well as what we have in the portfolio are very high free cash flow generating companies and available anywhere between three to six seven percent free cash flow yields Hence, we believe that uh, it's an opportune time to go overweight in the sector, and that explains our rationale for going overweight. So, in the last three, four months, you know, we have kind of trimmed our weightages in financial services, booked our profits because relatively IT and healthcare looked uh, better, and we have moved weights to kind of uh, both these uh, uh, sectors. The other sector, where again linked to the domestic uh, story that I talked about, where we remain quite positive, is construction where you know again our focus is on infrastructure oriented companies uh, which has done reasonably well in the last one year the other key underweight sector is global metals as well as oil and gas again both are related to the global cycle uh, especially oil and gas it's it's largely a result of an underweight of a key index weight uh, even bearing that we see limited opportunities in the sector however cheap the valuations are the second is metals. Uh, we do believe that while we are open, we, we kind of are evaluating it. But uh, clearly, we believe that the valuation has to correct a little bit more for us to go positive on the sector. Yeah, next one. Uh, so in terms of top holdings, I think it's a, it's a kind of a mix of uh, 
it's large and mid cap. So you find good quality mid caps such as Coromandel, Max, Fortis uh, amongst the top as well as Federal Bank. Uh, and because uh, mid cap is almost 41, 42%, uh, you get a fair share of both large and mid caps in the top 20 stocks. Uh, most of the small caps would figure in the right hand side. Uh, so if you look at again, companies like First Source, Apollo Tires, E-Clerks, uh, PNC, uh, or areas. Uh, I think one common feature is that they, they are reasonably good on quality. Uh, so they generate cash and generate decent ROCs as well as in valuation wise, they are extremely uh, kind of reasonable vis-a-vis -vis their longer term growth prospects. Yeah, next one. Uh, in terms of active positions, the top five, again, it's a mix of top-down and bottom-up approach. So essentially, uh, Fortis and Max are restructuring kind of stories where we believe that there is a very sharp improvement expected. Um, Federal Bank, again, a very similar thing. Coromandel, again, uh, it's, it's a very good company available at reasonable valuations. In terms of our key underweights, I think all of them are kind of, uh, I would say, what we call expensive stocks, uh, which kind of doesn't fit into the overall uh, strategy. In terms of key sector weights, I think today the bigger weights are in healthcare, construction, reality. And as I said, uh, the IT, probably that uh, weight is not reflected in the 57 bips, but our actual active weight is closer to 2%. I think, again, it's a combination of a, a top-down in terms of seeing good growth opportunities in the domestic-oriented sectors, as well as finding value in certain beaten-down sectors like IT and healthcare. It's a combination of both. And wherever we believe that valuations are excessive, such as in chemicals or in consumer part, uh, we have consciously avoided or gone underweight on those uh, sectors. So finally, just to kind of see how the three strategies have performed. So the three strategies are broadly same. The only difference being that equity savings fund, the long only part, which is about 35% of the portfolio, typically has a 100% large cap, which would emanate from, from the large cap stocks in both the other portfolios. Uh, which is why you see a very diverse return outcomes uh, on a three-year uh, 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 basis because all three have different asset allocations uh, 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 between them. So if you look at uh, core and equity hybrid, I think we have kind of been on a three-year basis. Uh, hybrid has kind of outperformed the benchmark. Uh, equity is kind of more or less in line with the benchmark. Uh, and even in the shorter time frame, you know, we have been in line or moderately outperforming the benchmark. So our endeavor would be to consistently outperform the benchmark over a longer time frame uh, through the kind of strategy which I talked about is to identify relative value uh, companies as well as focus on, on growth oriented companies at reasonable valuations wherever it is available and also having a very strong discipline on, on what we are buying and what we are avoiding in the portfolio. So with this, uh, I'm just uh, ending my uh, kind of presentation and uh, I would hand the floor back to Niranjan. Over to you, Niranjan. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Srivatsa, for that detailed uh, uh, rundown on the uh, uh, relative value strategy that you follow in UTI Core Equity Fund and uh, UTI Hybrid Equity Fund. So uh, we will now uh, move on and uh, uh, take the uh, uh, questions from the participants. And yes, uh, we have al already received a few questions uh, uh, before Anne, and uh, we will take them first. And then uh, we will also move on to take uh, uh, the online questions uh, which are coming up. Uh, yeah, participants, uh, please feel uh, free to uh, ask any of your questions. You can use the uh, comment box to uh, type in your uh, queries. So the first question, uh, this is a question to you, uh, uh, Srivatsa, uh, and the question goes uh, uh, like this. Key factors such as uh, US FDA inspection, US generic uh, pricing pressure, surge in raw material price, subdued growth outlook, et cetera, have added toll on uh, the performance of healthcare sector, right? So what are the key drivers that could uh, aid to sectors improved growth? You're on mute. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Niranjan, uh, for the question. Now, if I look at the US business, I think uh, consciously in the last uh, three to four years, uh, companies have kind of defocused on the US business. They have realized that this business requires a fairly high amount of capital. Uh, it has got its own share of volatilities because of the inspection issues, as well as there is a huge amount of pricing pressure, very huge amount of unpredictability, even if your quality is kind of uh, good and clean. Hence, they have kind of slowly defocused and kind of changed their capital allocation strategy uh, to focus more on the domestic part. So in my view, I think uh, the US today, probably if I look at the whole index or even if I take the top 10, top 20, there are just a couple of companies in the large cap space which kind of get disproportionately impacted because of US. Otherwise, broadly for the industry as a whole, US is becoming less and less relevant. Now, coming specifically on the US, uh, we believe that, you know, we have seen a very worse kind of a pricing pressure in the last three, four quarters. It's been in the mid-teens, closer to 12 to 15 percent on account of the fact that there is an excess supply there, lack of new product approvals, which is leading to the existing players kind of undercutting. Uh, today, what is happening is that uh, I think the inspections have started and some of them have borne the brunt of it in terms of having import alert. And slowly and slowly, people are also withdrawing from the market in terms of products. Which it's a classic demand and supply equilibrium which is happening where we have seen the worst impact of excess supply. We believe we are headed for a normalization here. I mean, the pricing pressure roughly ranges in mid single digit. We are now moving towards that probably in a couple of quarters. So companies which are US focused have a kind of a clean track record, could see a improvement in the fortune. But as I said, from a sector perspective, I think it has a far, far lesser impact than what it would have had five, six years back. Coming to the India part, which is more relevant, because that's, I would say, more than 60% of the overall sector, if I were to kind of uh, categorize, uh, that is, I think, looking more attractive now, you know, again, that uh, that the sector saw probably some benefit out of COVID because your normal intake of medicines went up. You also had a lot of COVID-specific products, which became in blockbusters. So as the impact of COVID waned, we saw some kind of an impact on the on the sector in terms of growth rates, uh, which we believe is now normalizing. So longer term, the industry has grown in double digit. Uh, we do believe that this has a potential to revert back to that level in the coming years. And uh, that's kind uh, and and again the companies are investing more and more into domestic space to kind of improve their growth rates by hiring more uh, medical representatives, buying out some tail brands, getting into new kind of sub therapy segments. Uh, hence, a lot of capital allocation is also happening. So, from an overall perspective, we believe that the things are looking up in the healthcare sector, and also the hospitals have done very well in the last couple of years because of you know uh, kind of consolidation happening in the sector and as well as post covid we have seen a fairly high level of uh, of you know uh, uh, hospital patients intake and all that so considering all this we believe that the fortunes in the near term at least in the next 12 to 18 months look very good for the pharma industry and in terms of valuations also the valuations are quite reasonable vis-a-vis -vis the longer term history hence the outlook on the sector is good which is also reflected in a big overweight position that we have in both the core as well as in the hybrid equity fund. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. Yeah, thank you so much for such a detailed uh, answer. We will take the second question. Uh, this is a question to uh, Vetri. So India's contribution to global goods exports is just about 2%, uh, far below of China, US, uh, and, and Germany. So would uh, PLI and uh, FTA, so uh, production linked incentive and uh, free trade agreements, be a catalyst for uh, Indian exports? Question, Niranjan. Um, I think the answer is that, you know, if India is not part of the global goods export, uh, you know, the global supply chains, the global value chains, as they are called, it's partly a function of the fact that we are not very competitive when it comes to manufacturing, particularly, I would say, lower end manufacturing. And uh, that lack of competitiveness and lack of scale uh, means that we are not able to compete effectively. So I think what the government is now trying to do with PLIs and FTAs is sort of try and address some of the impediments 
try and provide economic incentives and subsidies to overcome the inherent lack of scale and the inherent lack of competitiveness. But what we must remember is that things like PLI, et cetera, which are, a, you know, in the nature of a subsidy for a short period of time, eventually these are meant to go away over, a, you know, they will be provided for three to five years and then they will go away. So during that period, industry needs to be able to build scale such that it is able to compete effectively. Second, competitiveness of Indian industry has to be in place. And I would suspect that many Indian businesses would still continue to say that some of the policies relating to land, labor, logistics continue to be an impediment in terms of them being competitive. So I would say this is an excellent initiative by the government to, you know, head on, try and take on these issues and try and raise the competitiveness of manufacturing that will not only allow a larger proportion of our population to get involved in manufacturing where incomes levels can be far higher than those in construction or in agriculture, but also, you know, allows us to uh, become far more significant in terms of global goods exports, whereas we are already quite significant in terms of global service export. So I think this is a good enabling step but we are still slightly distant from the point where we can say that, you know, the basic competitive disadvantages have been addressed. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, we will take the third question before we move on to the uh, online question. Uh, this is a question to you, uh, Vatsa. So what are the pros and cons of following relative value strategy for portfolio construction, which is followed by you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, see, I think uh, uh, one needs to understand when the value strategy or, you know, it's typically, you know, it's very rarely that both value and uh, growth would do well at the same time. So we have conflicting cycles. Uh, but generally, I think if I look at the last eight, nine years pattern, what I do observe is growth strategies typically tend to do well uh, when the rates are lower. I think the reason is that there is a kind of a premium that you pay for the longer term growth. So as the rates are lower, I mean, your, your, your kind of uh, your, your terminal value and all goes up. Uh, that's a time that strategy does well, as well as a kind of a high quality strategy also does extremely well when there is a very big recession in the market because generally people then focus on quality and defensive they focus on cash rich companies uh, that's the time value kind of you know takes a knock so and and the second part is that uh, typically you may not find much of value in the large caps you need to go outside of that in in mid and mid, mid and small caps which is what the strategy is following i mean hybrid has 30 percent outside of large caps and core has a far higher share uh there you would have the added kind of volatility of higher mid caps higher small caps liquidity which is typically also associated with a strategy which has got a slightly higher share of mid and small caps uh that would be specific the case because you may not find value in on the top 100 companies you would need to go outside that uh, to find a kind of a relative uh, value. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, now we will move on to take uh, online questions. So uh, this is a, a question uh, to uh, uh, Vetri coming from Mr. Vikas Mehta. Uh, if the focus of central banks, including RBI, is likely to move from inflation to uh, growth, what are the impending risks uh, to the economy and uh, equity markets? So I would say let's break that up into two parts. Right now, the focus of most central banks is still in terms of overcoming the inflation channel uh, challenge. I don't think any central bank is saying that, uh, you know, at this point of time, we are focused on supporting growth. So really, central bank focus right now is on the inflation risk and not on the growth risk. Having said that, you know, when you think about what are the risks to, uh, you know, in general at this point of time, it's very unusual that today we are in a situation where GDP growth is already slowing, monetary policy continues to tighten, and your fiscal policy is simultaneously uh, demonstrating restraint. So if there is a risk, I think the risk is essentially at this point of time that eventually growth slows and earnings estimates disappoint. Uh, equally, on the opposite side, once we get past the point where central banks feel 
that they have already addressed the inflation issue, that is where they would tend to get far more positive uh, or they would start to focus a lot more on what do they need to support growth. And once they get past that last hike and once they sort of get to that point where they turn growth supportive, then you would have upside risk in the markets. But I think that follows a period where you potentially have the risk of earnings disappointment. So to me, the biggest risk today is earnings disappointments. At some point of time, if the market, you know, valuations were to reach a level where the earnings uh, risks are in the price, then perhaps we would start to focus a lot more on upside surprises as central banks turn supportive. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Vetri. So uh, I will uh, again uh, take the next question to you. So uh, this is a question coming from uh, G. Vijay and a few others. So uh, while uh, there has been some recovery in credit growth, is there any expectation of growth stagnation due to delay in the capex plans amid the uh, rising inflation uh, and uh, uh, sorry, falling inflation and rising rates? Good question. Um, I think, you know, credit growth has obviously coming off a very weak base of 2021. It has accelerated. What has also helped the credit growth without doubt is the fact that uh, there has been high inflation, right? So if you are to uh, have three months of inventory of crude oil, when it is $100 a barrel, that's very different from your requirement of working capital when crude oil is only $40 a barrel, just as a simple example. But to my mind, that inflation-related surge in uh, uh, lending is perhaps coming closer to an end. It is not clear at this point of time if you are going to have significant borrowing demand for CAPEX. Um, you know, last few weeks, again, as the company's earning seasons are coming through, what we are in fact seeing is companies sort of delaying their CAPEX saying, look, right now the global signals in terms of growth are not very positive. So I'm not sure that will be a source of demand. But I think the additional growth which would come for credit uh, from the banking system in India would essentially come because remember Indian companies also have a lot of dollar denominated borrowings. A lot of those borrowings happened in 2021 when rates were very low and now rates have moved up quite significantly. So I do expect that many Indian companies may now take a call to sort of pay down the dollar borrowings where it's quite expensive and shift to the rupee market which at the margin will add to the growth of uh, credit in India. Yeah, thanks. There is a follow-up question. So uh, what is your view on the PSUs and also uh, PSU banks, uh, given that uh, there is a good performance in the last uh, uh, few months? And uh, what's your take on their uh, con I mean, continued performance, let's say, for next one year or two years? Interesting question. See, you know, I would always say that we don't distinguish on the basis of are you a private bank or are you a, a PSU bank. To us, what matters is what is the return on assets that a good bank is able to generate? What is the quality of its liability franchise? And what is the track record that the bank has demonstrated in terms of its ability to manage asset quality over a cycle? Now, it so happens when you look at these three metrics, very often you find that the private sector banks have done a better job. But I don't think that is a fully fair comment. If you go back to 15 to 18, we know that many private sector banks also had a problem. Equally, we do know that in the last one or two years, some of the PSU banks have actually done very well, both in terms of quality of franchise, as well as in terms of enhancing the return on assets. But unless return on assets for a lending institution go above 1.5 to 1.6 percent, their ability to cover cost of capital then becomes very, very limited, particularly if we were to presume that they will not leverage their books more than, you know, seven, uh, maybe even six times to seven times. So therefore, as a result of that, our preference would always be only for those banks which have quality liability franchises and typically have ROAs above one and a half percent. There could be rare cases where you could find certain banks with ROAs just above 1% with higher leverage. Therefore, they're able to generate an ROE maybe which is above 14-15%. But you know, at UTI, we will always re-emphasize this point that sustainable business models are built and created by institutions which create a return on capital or return on equity which is higher than cost of capital. Uh, doesn't matter whether it is a private bank or a PSU bank. If you cannot create that economic value, you are not creating shareholder value. Sure. Thanks, Vitri. So the next question is to uh, uh, Srivatsa. Uh, uh, Srivatsa, the question goes like this. The consumer sector demand has been uh, under stress uh, for the last couple of years on the back of inflationary uh, uh, pressures. 
And uh, since it is expected to remain elevated, what are the key impetus uh, which could drive incremental cash in the hands of cust uh, consumers? Yeah, uh, so if you look at the consumer sector, I think uh, specifically in the last uh, six to nine months, they've been impacted by high inflation uh, on account of uh, increase in the global commodity prices, especially on the FMCG side, as well as in the consumer durable side. Uh, and they have not been able to pass it on fully to the end customers because the demand has also not been very, very uh, great. So we believe that I think as the income level rises, so if you are forecasting a higher GDP, the income level rises, I think that would lead to a better demand. And more importantly, I think it will also give the leeway uh, for the sector to pass on the hikes. And the other possible tailwind which the companies can get next year is also those prices have cooled down, like the palm oil prices, for example, which is a key ingredient for soaps, has cooled down quite a lot in the last three, four months. So typically these companies don't pass on the benefit i mean they typically tend to retain the benefit so they that will ensure that the under absorption which they have had will probably get covered in the next uh, six to nine months but yes given the kind of gdp growth we are seeing in terms of uh, nominal uh, uh, gdp growth next year there should be a good improvement in the demand and more importantly the ability of the companies to pass on the kind of inflationary impact uh, will will also get stronger as as we get into a better demand environment. And the second aspect is they are now seeing a tailwind of lower commodity prices, which should gradually help them over the next three to four quarters. Sure, thanks, uh, Vatsa. Uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, we will take last few questions. A uh, couple of them are on <clears throat> sectors. So, uh, Vatsa, to you again. The R two sector seems to have come off uh, from the supply side issues. So uh, is this growth expected uh, uh, to continue and uh, indicate recovery in the sector? Uh, you're talking about auto sector, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if I look at the auto sector, I think uh, whether it is two wheelers, whether it is passenger vehicles or whether it is CV, except tractor, I think all the other sub segments are meaningfully below the uh, below the pre covid levels especially if i look at the two wheeler you know that is at least 20 25% below what what was at the peak before the pre covid uh, now a lot of factors have contributed i think one is there has been supply side issues so inability of the companies to ramp up the production if you look at the passenger companies like Maruti and Mahindra, they have very active backlogs, which clearly shows that it's not a demand issue, it's more of a supply issue. Uh, again, point number two is that the hikes, especially in the entry-level motorbikes or in the two-wheeler segment, has been significant in the last three, four years because of the regulatory changes to move to BSX as well as insurance, compulsory insurance. So the average cost of an entry-level bike has gone up by almost 30-40% in the last three, four years, which has kind of impacted the demand. Going forward, we believe that... Uh, because of these two factors, the demand would improve. And given the fact that globally we are heading towards a recession, uh, there are improving chances of the, the supply kind of receding and you know, chips, supply of chips improving. We see good times uh, ahead for the sector in terms of growth, as well as the recent commodity prices fall uh, should also help in the uptick in the margins uh, over the next couple of years. Sure, sure. Thanks. One on IT sector, uh, you also have overweight exposure in this uh, sector. However, with the expectation of uh, recession and slowdown in the US, so do you think uh, there could be growth challenges here? Uh, see, I think today IT is far, far more central to an organization than any time in the last five years, ten years. I think uh, it is a, it is a, it is a core strategy of uh, of of any organization. So. Probably, you know, 10 years back, if, if an organization, global organization were to cut the IT budgets by 20%, it may not be 20, it would be 10 or it would be 5. The other aspect, what we look for essentially in a lot of sectors is what are we paying for growth? Now, there's no denying the fact that this sector is a very high free cash flow generating sectors, best in class corporate governance, and they also return free cash flow to the investors. So, our analysis shows in most of the cases it ranges from you know in the portfolio in my portfolio it ranges from as low as three four percent to twelve percent which i believe is clearly achievable 
in a in the medium to short term while yes we know that there could be shorter term challenges but we look at a slightly medium term view and given the fact that now there are kind of a support from the for the companies in terms of because they have a very high free cash flow they distribute 50 to 80 percent of the free cash flow in the form of dividend and buyback there is a kind of a support valuation and it's not very far away from that the current valuation so from a risk reward perspective we believe it is very good Though there could be some shorter term, you know, maybe a couple of quarter challenges in terms of growth, but we don't see a case for a longer term growth to decline meaningfully from what the current market prices are implying for growth. Sure, what's up? Thanks a lot. Uh, but we, uh, although we typically don't take stock level questions, there is one on the Adani group, given that uh, it is in the news uh, for some reason now. So the recent sell-off uh, in Adani group of the companies may uh, have put many of the retail investors off guard. So uh, as a fund house, uh, uh, how are the portfolios uh, insulated from such volatility and how does the investment process aid in avoiding uh, businesses that could destroy wealth? Sure. Thanks, Niranjan. Thanks for that uh, question. Well, we can't directly answer on any you know specific company or any group. That's not uh, in our domain to do that. Uh, but I will always say that you know what I think an investment process does, uh, and particularly the investment process at UTI, uh, it keeps us away from companies or at least raises a warning light when we see companies which don't have strong operating cash flow, uh, when we see companies which are not able to cover cost of capital, they are not creating a positive spread for shareholders whereby return on capital is in excess of cost of capital. And eventually, of course, you know, different strategies might have a different approach towards what they think are the valuations appropriate for a particular business. But, you know, when we manage any strategy, we always have a view on these three elements. And I would say in general, our focus on these three elements ensures or at least to our mind reduces the number of mistakes that we are likely to make by investing in businesses uh, which could be of a poorer quality. Now, I'm not suggesting anything about this particular you know, group which you asked about. I'm just saying that from an investment pro process point of view, these are the three ways in which we can triangulate and make sure that our investments are happening in a set of companies with also very importantly portfolio sizing playing a role right because when you have a diversified portfolio the other risk management tool we have is how much are we actually exposed to an individual company and we typically run portfolios which are at least 30 companies all the way up to you know 55 60 companies so that's another way in which we can do risk management within our portfolios but you know that's the generic way in which we would always do risk management in the context of our investment process uh, return on capital uh, operating cash flows and finally valuations uh sure Vetri. thanks uh, we have uh, already uh, uh over the time uh so one uh, last question so uh, uh maybe two questions uh given that the return divergence between the growth and value so in fact you have been talking about uh, this uh, in most of the uh, webinar so uh, but as we get the queries on this uh, there are a few investors who have been asking so if you can again uh, uh, share your views in terms of the return divergence between the growth and value, how uh, uh, investors should approach uh, this. And uh, lastly, uh, in the wake of stretched valuation in equities and uh, improving environment uh, for investing in the long duration funds uh, in a debt side. So uh, if you can uh, explain what could be the portfolio stands for new investors looking for uh, long term wealth creation and also uh, for investors who are looking for parking their retirement corpus uh, and looking for uh, uh, reaping their regular income. So very quickly, Niranjan, you know, I think growth and quality, uh, growth quality on one side and value on the other side, I think Vatsa also alluded to, you know, this being change of season and styles, which keeps happening in the marketplace. Uh, and I'll only take the person who asked the question back to the words of John Bogle, uh, the founder of Vanguard, and he essentially said that growth and value uh, are useful to think about in the context of giving you a portfolio which is diversified across styles. So do not use it as a timing device. It's very difficult to use this as a timing device. Uh, and, you know, it's very tough to be able to catch that swing in timing. But by keeping diversity of styles in your portfolio, you reduce the overall volatility in alpha that you 
you are likely to experience relative to the benchmark. So, you know, that is what I would say relating to this. Use growth and value as diversification tools rather than as a timing tool of trying to accentuate the alpha. Uh, the second point you made on rates and attractiveness, uh, I would actually say, Niranjan, that no, we are at this point not recommending going all the way to the extreme long end of the yield curve. Uh, because at this point of time, those yields have not expanded very dramatically. Where the yields have moved up very dramatically is really in the extreme short end, all the way up to about three to four years. There, there has been a dramatic uh, move up in the yields as the RBI has uh, hiked rates over the last year. So our recommendation is actually to look at fixed income strategies, which are with duration going up to a maximum of, let's say, three, three and a half years. Uh, that is where we think the sweet spot in the curve is. As far as the very long end of the yield curve is concerned, I think over there, there will be an opportunity if RBI over time or rather the MPC over time is able to deliver on the inflation target of 4%, not just 4 plus or minus 2%. But I think that at this point of time is still an evolving situation. So, you know, that would really qualify more as a bet to take in a very gradual manner. Our main comfort in fixed income is in the two to four year part of the yield curve, where you can not only get a positive yield over and above what inflation is, but if you stay invested in those fixed income for three schemes for three years, it's also very advantageous from a tax point of view. Yeah, so maybe Srivatsa, if you can answer to uh, uh, this question for investors who are looking for parking their retirement corpus and uh, reap the regular income. So is there any uh, thoughts from you? Yeah, I think uh, one should be cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, based on the age, you're, uh, you're, you should kind of uh, have a kind of a suitable asset allocation uh, uh, strategy. So if you're to park the retirement income, I would say it has to be at least a 50-50 towards debt and equity and preferably a less volatility because as you kind of age, you would want to see less volatility in your uh, in your overall investment. But uh, given today's environment, I think the hybrid products offer a very good opportunity because it solves the asset allocation issue for the uh, for for the for the individual for the investor. So I would say a hybrid products, uh, you know, the range of products, right, from a regular income to a hybrid, a aggressive hybrid, would be very ideal uh, for somebody uh, who is kind of looking to invest in the retirement uh, uh, um, in proceeds. Sure. Thanks a lot, Vatsa. Uh, participants, uh, I hope uh, we could take most of your questions. If the, anything is left out, kindly uh, uh, feel free to get in touch uh, with our uh, uh, team. So they will be more than happy to answer your uh, queries. So with that, I will uh, hand it over back to Betty uh, for closing remarks. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Niranjan. Good to have you on camera with us today. Uh, and just to add, you can always email us uh, as well at the email ID, ask at the rate UTI, uh, where, uh, you know, we'll be happy to receive your questions and we can even take them up next time. But I'll end over here. I know we've gone well over the one hour limit, but because there were so many questions from you, we thought it was worthwhile to address all those questions. Uh, so thank you for joining us on this edition of the uh, Monthly Market Equity Insight, uh, you know, from me and Srivatsa. And we look forward to connecting again in the month of March. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.